G'day bird nerds, a fantastic bonus episode for you today. Have you ever driven past one of those amazing murals on a wall or on a wheat silo or on a massive tank and wondered, how do they do that? How do they get such realism into that work on such a large scale? Well, today you can find out. I spoke with Perth artists Brenton C and Sally Edmonds. And Brenton works on that large scale and Sally is an amazing detailed artist and their work prominently features birds. I wanted to talk to them to find out how how did they feel about their art informing conservation and being a catalyst and a driver for awareness. And we got into some pretty interesting stuff. Now, we referenced a video in the conversation, and you can see that video and the work that we were talking about on the page that accompanies this episode, thebirdemergency.com slash art. All the contact details for Brenton and Sally are there. I hope you really enjoy this. It was a great conversation. I'm just sorry it took so long to get it out into the feed. Enjoy. Hello, bird nerds. Thanks for joining us. It's the bird emergency. I'm Graham. I am a bird nerd. And today I am a connoisseur, a critic of art. And it's marvellous to be able to be joined by some very, very talented folk and one in particular that I've been following and bouncing messages back and forth for quite some time since Tegan from Tegan Douglas from BirdLife in WA said, hey, you've got to have a look at this dude. Have a look at what this guy can do with parrots and honey eaters on the side of a wall. So it's an absolute pleasure. I think let's go. Let's go there. That's a bit nicer to introduce Sally Edmonds and Brenton C. Brent. Now, Brenton, you're in Fremantle. Sally, are you in Perth or are you in the regions? Tell us about where you're. I'm in Kalamunda. Now, where's Kalamunda compared to Perth City, for those of us who don't know? Up in the hills. Okay. And, Brenton, you're in Frio. So, question for both of you. Are your studios at your houses or have you got a dedicated workspace where you head off to work you can go first sally mine's probably a bit longer. i'm in my studio right now so i'm very lucky it's in my house it's nice and big big workspace but also another room adjacent where i can I've got a hanging system so i can do exhibitions and things here as well and it looks out onto my garden which is and there's big trees lots of birdies so i'm happy terrific <laughs> and brendan my- uh, brendan what about your workspace yeah, my situation has changed over the year. Before murals, I actually did paint canvases. So I had a studio by the city area, just in a warehouse, only because it was the cheapest. Yeah. You want something nicer, it looks a bit of greenery. The cost goes up as far as the studio goes. That's for sure. You might as well buy a house. So now, yeah, I'm in a, I'm in a studio in a city Fremantle that looks sort of the historic street. But this is just where I come to admin, really. As a mural artist, I'm all out, out about most of the time. So I do and here and there. Sometimes if it's a rainy day like this day, I might get a chance to catch up on small commissions that are on panels. Obviously, if you buy me. But yeah, this is just where I answer my emails and do my concepts, basically. So it doesn't need to be anything special. <laughs> Terrific. What, what I'd like to do, because we've got the two of you here, is if you don't mind, Brenton, we'll just do a bit of a, a an introduction into some of Sally's work and yep. Sally's interests and then I'll come back to your sort of the work that I've seen of yours that I want to feature and then we'll talk about what you do and then how it can influence conservation which is really the angle I want to take. I'm keen to hear about Sally's work as well. I've heard a lot about her so that's why I thought it'd be great to get Sally on so I can learn a bit as well. Sally sent me some images so for those of you who don't know about Sally, let's get to know a little bit about Sally. Sally, who's your, who's your friend there in that picture? 
That's Fluff Bum. He's, he lives at the Carrickin in the Martin in the Perth Hills. He's a rescue black cookie that can't be released because he's just not able to be out in the wild anymore. So he lives at Carrickin and they let me go and visit, helping them out a little bit with print sales, like donations. So they let me go in and hang out in my happy place, which you can see how happy I am. They're lovely. And he's very romantic. But the first time we met, he actually flew at me and bounced off my head. <laughs> I don't think he liked my camera. But this last time I went to see him, he was very romantic with me, as you can see. You say, uh, that's who? Randy. I don't need to say any more about Randy. <laughs> Dominant in the age, that's the interactive aviary at Carrickin. So there's a lot of birds in there. Big aviary, very tall, very high. And he's the boss, I think, in there. And he, put, he puts his mark on you as soon as you go in. Maybe it's just me, I don't know. But yeah, I'll just let him wear himself up, really. <laughs> All right. We'll talk about your interest in Carrickin a little bit more, but I just want people to be able to have a look at style of art that you do. And here's two of the shots that you've sent me, obviously, glass and that's a, a barn owl, yeah. Mm-hmm. And and then something which I really is that the way you do these portraits, these intimate portraits, and there's obviously an emu and whitetail black cockatoo or what carnabies, I think, is that what? That's carnaby, yeah. That yeah. was cat. Yeah. Yes, at Kanyana, which is in Les Murdy, they do some, not exactly the same as Carrickin, but it's definitely a rescue centre. And he's a year old boy, very lovely. Exactly as I've portrayed him is what he's like. Very funny and very smart. I look for, when I'm looking for reference, this is what I'm looking for. So I took the photo of Kep. I didn't take one of the emu, but I searched for that image for about a year to get exactly the right one. So I want that, that feeling you get from those pictures, the portraits, being intimate and connecting to it. Okay. We'll do a bit of an introduction of Brenton's work and then we'll have to talk about the collision of photography and art as well. But I'm just going to run this compilation video that I put together. Brenton, it's quite quick for these clips, but if you could perhaps just tell us where each one is and then I'll run it again if we need to talk about the subject matter. But I think they're all, it's all pretty self explanatory about what it is. I might narrate it as well. Yeah. This is the Lake Claremont. So this has been an area that has had a lot of new growth added by a lot of the people volunteering. Yeah. So the French Well, this is Perth Zoo. I did this, the Western Ground Parrot Breeding Program that we got there, which a lot of people. Stop now. It's behind the scenes and kept a little bit secret because parents had kept aside. This is a white cheeked honey eater. It was a parrot bush. This is inside someone's property, Fremantle, down the backyard, just a, a tiny little backyard. They didn't have much to look at. This is a barn owl named Chip. So this was the, the barn owl that was the mascot for Native Animal Rescue in Malaga. Unfortunately, it passed away. So I did a portrait of Chips for them at this. A bunny tailed yeah, that I painted at what's it called? It's a, an environmental center, Rockingham. Yep. A boating frog from memory. And that is painted on the side of the shopping center at Well, so, which I've been beautifying over the years. So I've gradually taken over. So this is a Western crawl <laughs> and a Western spine build with some grandest. Yep. Uh, this is land center in Malanga. And this is a bobtail. With some silver, that's from memory. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just case, yeah. On the, yep, on the front of home. And then we got some red wings, fairy wren with blue lesh noctia. And this was painted on a uh, seal, the worm all. So a, a trick and subject to, to work with. But uh, yeah, worked onto the three sides. It's just like you could admire it from wherever you were positioned. Yeah, and these are playing placed all around the southwest. A very good kingfisher with swallow. Turtle. I think I did swallow the battle. I can't remember if it was that or Joe Wax, but I think maybe it's one of the battle. That's the punch of a residence. And this is a mixture of different flora and fauna sounds around the Albany Ranch. This is inside a property down south in Albany. So this is the room. Now we've got a Western Yellow Robert and a Jackie Wing. Yeah, but these are on. I'm just trying to remember. This is the ring that I've just done. Manning. Suburb just out of Perth. This is the front wall of their house. So they're 
the entrance to the house is just on the right. So they see this come in their home every day, which is quite fun to do. They've also plants a lot of native species. It is a male, it's on black on the two I took a photo of at a park, Samson Park, just around the corner from me. So I didn't have to travel far for this one, but he posed lightly to me. It's a pose that you don't really see very often. Is a pair of carnabies feeding on some Norfolk pine. I like this photo because it, it really shows the uh, closeness between tears that you don't always see, which is nice to have. And I just put this last one on Twitter, just but this is a red-eared firetail that I photographed in Denmark. Denmark or El, I was going between the two. So, yeah. <laughs> so there we go. I wanted to put the the photographs in at the end. Is that someone at your place doing the... <laughs> oh, there might be someone in reverse the truck. Yeah, yeah, I think that sounds like it. <laughs> so there we go. So I want to get away from all of those and back to us. There we are. So I wanted to put the photos at the end there because without having spoken to both of you about how you do your creating, obviously photography is how you how you get your inspiration and perhaps a bit of a template for for the images that you have to then get from your eyes into your head and then out onto the media. Is that how the process goes? Or have you got an idea first and then you go looking for a subject to photograph so that you can then get all the details? Sally, do you want to start with that? I bought quite often I've got an idea in my head for a really long time and I have to look for the reference material for it. Other times I'll just be trolling through or I'll go and take a load of photographs and one will stand out to me and then I'll just use that. That's really funnily, I was having this discussion. I had to do a talk the other day because I have, I don't hide the fact that I use photographs for my work because, but a lot of bird artists particularly don't admit to using photographs because they, it's frowned upon. And I was pulled up about it by someone and they didn't agree with me using photographs. But I actually think that certainly, obviously for the detail, it's really important, but also photography can give you things that you're naked. I can't anyway. Like a lot of the time I'm seeing. I've learned to, I really trained my eye to see color in a certain way. You probably have too, Brenton. And you'll get things from photographs that you wouldn't see with your eye. Like on the curve of a beach, you might see sometimes you'll get an edge of magenta or a bright turquoise color. Just, you just wouldn't see it. So I love using photographs. I honestly couldn't really do what I do without them, but I use Photoshop a lot. So for example, I had a picture in my head for a long time of a big flock of glass flying. But I want to have a feeling of depth. So I went, I found photographs. Um, someone actually let me use their photographs and I put it all into layers. Each color was a separate layer. And the further back they were, the more blurry they were. And I built up the image in Photoshop first because I knew what I wanted. But it's, I'm not, funnily enough, I can't really visualize it so much. I've got a vague idea in my head, but I need to actually see it. So I built the picture in Photoshop first, then I translated it to, actually, that was a big painting. So yeah, photographs are absolutely vital to what I do, certainly. And I've, yeah, I always wonder when people say they don't use photographs. I think, well, what are you doing there? Chasing them around or, <laughs> I don't know, are you working from stuff birds? <laughs> it's uh, a bit horrid. Yeah. But do you take your right. photographs, Brenton? I used to take pretty much all of my photographs. And then when my daughter came along, a little bit of my photography time went into that <laughs> order time. So, so nowadays, <laughs> if I finish a year early and I have a few hours to spare, then I might go out with my kids. It's just finding the time out. I've got to spend my But any bird photographer might spend four hours looking for something. You're not just going to leave after four hours. You're going to spend as long as you can with that bird. bird. Stay for uh, so for me to tell my wife, I'm just going to go out for a couple of hours and take some photos. I might <laughs> take two hours just walking through the bushes and see anything. So I've got to be quite choosy. But yeah, when I did have a, a full day free, I would go out and time it set species that I wanted to paint. If I had a client contact me about something that they wanted to paint there, then I would take that opportunity to go find it. So I did the research into where it lived and then the closest place to birth that I could see it, and I would go off and, and try and find it. Yeah. You both have a style that is what 
realistic, I would say, but you're not trying to represent that this is how it really is. There's obviously distortions and yeah. exaggerations and emphases that you are trying to get across. Yeah. And Brenton, you are very detailed with how you approach the vegetation and as well as the birds and the animals. Yep. You're reasonably botanically correct, which is a bit of a feat. So how much time do you spend getting to know the vegetation and the animals and the bird species, their habits, their the kind of uh, habitat that they exist in, before you try and commit them to a wall or to, you know, what, is it masonite or canvas when you're doing smaller commissions? What materials are you using as well? Yeah, so wall surfaces can be absolute. And that's where the, I think that's where my style comes into it quite a bit. So I, a lot of the time I have to pull back on a lot of the detail depending on the surface. So I've worked on corrugated surfaces. I've worked on rubber brick surfaces. And if I was to treat that like a gallery artwork, I would be there for weeks. So I have to treat a mural as in an artwork that you see, like, for instance, from here. So if I was to stand here, it needs to look good from here. That's how you treat a mural. Generally, you've got to stand a metre away from it to take in what you're seeing. You want to stand back and take the whole image as a whole. So that's what you have to do with murals. You have to stand back and say, yeah, that looks right, or I need to add a little bit there or move something around there. So, yeah, for me, it's capturing... The shape first of something because the day as a photographer or a bird was it's the shape of something that catches your eye first and the color. So to get the color and shape you're on the track to get in to get in the likeness there. So these are a few photos. Obviously I haven't taken these. This is Ross Gibbons photo of the retail dragon there. So yeah, I do approach a lot of photographers, generally through Flickr. I find Flickr has the best photos up there. Uh, and now I'll approach the photographer. And ask for permission if I can use that image to paint from. And majority of the time they will say yes, so that's great. And then I make sure that I credit the photographer in any posts that I do. Because at the end of the day, their photography is their art. They, the image that they put up on the internet is the image at its best. So they've done a lot of editing. They put a lot of time in the field. They protect their craft. And I think as someone that has is quite I'm a very amateur photographer, but as someone that has taken photos, I know how much time goes into it. So I, I definitely don't take the photographers for yeah. they need recognition. Oh, and that's something that I think people like doing what I'm doing need to be perhaps a little bit more aware of and really try to let people understand and exploit the commercial value of these images. They're not just pretty things there's a purpose behind making them and we'll talk about we'll talk about that when it comes to your art in in a minute but it's a significant investment to create those things and i just want to draw attention for people here this this tank i think can you see the mouse doing its thing there sally or not you probably can't it's really not being broadcast but in the upper centre, you can see the basket of the 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 is this a lift or the yeah. So this is how it's done. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a very significant investment to get. You got to hire the equipment. You got to be insured. You've got to have someone else there being your lookout, your safety buddy, and yeah, and probably working with a reference drawing. I would imagine that's grit, gritted out, Brenton. We might talk about yeah, that. Yeah, so I don't. I generally don't grid any flora i try and be a little green with the flora so a lot of the time i'm working from a bunch of photos to create the flora which is i'm choosing one flower out of one photo and then another stem out of another photo and merging them to frame my artwork in a way so if i was to paint directly off a of photograph of a bunch of flora and just stick it onto a mirror it's not going to work so i've got to make sure that it's framing the subject matter is the right way it's working, but also looks like it's something that could be coming out of the ground at the same time. Yeah, so the at that scale on the tank, I did grip the floor up there just so that it was easy to work with the proportions because when I'm up there, 
it takes a long time to get back onto the ground and have a look at what I'm doing. Working with a grid takes away that, that time. But yeah, generally, if I'm working ground level, I don't need to use grid for flora. Yeah, I doubt there's going to be too many people that are correct. The when a when a leaf is two millimeters longer than it should be, or something like that. Different, the different with birds. Yeah, no, someone will pull you up on something wrong with a bird. <laughs> I don't want to talk too much about how the sausage is sizzled or how the sauce is made yep. today. Yep, yep. That's a whole nother episode. But sure. I'd promoted the whole idea about your art and now we've introduced the kind of art that you both do and and how it how it can influence conservation. And Brenton, you do a lot of stuff which is in public places as well as doing private commissions with those homes and fences and courtyards and yep. and building interiors and whatnot. But they're still being seen by the public. Some of your commissions with the the zoo and whatnot are with conservation related causes, and I don't really want to talk about that because they're already in the know and in the circle. But I'm interested for both of you. Do you think that when people like and appreciate your art when they first see it, that it then has a has the effect of causing them to go and learn more about? wildlife or vegetation, habitat in general, or, Sally, with the rescue centres that you're really interested in, do you find that people will then become converts to the cause? Perhaps, Sally, if you can go first. Yes, certainly. With what I do, I try to, ethos of my work is to get across that birds aren't just birds. It's Lots of people don't really see birds the way I do. I live with eight birds. I know that they're all very different character, and the same goes for the birds out in the wild. They're all they all have their own personalities and relationships and lifelong companionship with a mate and things like that. And so I try to get across most of the time in my work that there is a character behind that bird. It's not just a pretty bird. And I think people really like that. I use a lot of eye contact in my work, so the bird's actually looking at you while you're looking at the bird and. People connect with it. They say, well, I feel like I really feel the character from that bird. So that piques their interest. They might not be interested in a bird at all. And I think that if people are interested in a piece of art, they might not be into birds or wildlife or anything, but then that leads them to perhaps look at what you do, go onto your Instagram or your Facebook, and that's where I can then, can't, I don't do much. I donate some money and I promote if I can on my stuff, but everything you do helps. So I'll go on my Instagram and I'll go to Karachin or I'll promote Karachin on there or Kanyana and just say, you can go, you can come and do this. If there's a picture of me with Slough Bum, you can do that. You just can go down to Karachin on one of their tours. You too can go and have a lovely black cockatoo on your shoulder and interact with them. And that certainly has been interesting to a lot of people. I think people listen to their friends and I have a really good relationship with a lot of my followers, and I think people listen to their friends more than they listen to they're being told what to do. So if you're saying, oh, this is really cool, you could do this, they're like, oh, yeah, and then they want to go and try it, and then someone they talk to might want to try it. All these little things all add up to raising awareness, and even if it's only helping the rescue centres, it's a start, but then people start thinking, well, what else could I do? Could I plant stuff in my garden, or can I have one of these nesting boxes, or, or donate money? So it all helps. I think that what we can do is certainly, it might be huge, but it certainly makes a difference, which is all good. Brenton, before we come to you, I want to follow up with something Sally said there. When you, you said, Sally, your followers, you referenced your followers. Now you're using Instagram and yeah. Brenton's on Instagram and Twitter. I'm wondering whether over time and as your work gets better known and social media helps that, occur are you aware of any of your followers that are becoming real warriors for the cause like that they get they move from being appreciators of your work and then they become bird watchers or that they become volunteers at the rescue centers or that they develop a a deep interest in a certain habitat type and they join a friends group. I'm wondering whether you are aware of people shifting their attitude after being involved in your art. 
I don't know if it's after being involved in in art or if they were already that way anyway, and that's why they're interested in life and bird art. So I'm not can't really answer that one. I'd like to think so. <laughs> that would be nice. I certainly have directed people that way, or they go that way. It's up to them. Do you see a substantial growth year on year in your social media following, like in the in in the Selly tribe? Yeah, yeah. It's weird actually. I was really struggling with Facebook. It's fine. Well, if they follow you in Facebook, then then they tend to stick around. But Instagram was a real slog to get it up to. I got to ten thousand, but since I hit ten thousand, it's just taken off. And I think I've gained another three hundred in the last couple of weeks. So you're like, what's going on? But I do interact a lot with my pod with people. If anybody ever comments, I've only ever had one troll, and that was I think that's more about them than me. But I always reply, always respond, and I love that actually because it's such a solid. Terry pursuit being an artist well I'm never alone with eight birds and two dogs and a husband <laughs> it's lovely having that interaction with people I really enjoy it and so I tend to spend a lot of time on it and I know a lot of them they use these funny names for their Instagram names and I tend to know a lot of them by their real names so I and I remember <laughs> so I, I will it, reply to them and I really appreciate everybody that follow it's amazing really it's a fabulous resource Brenton can we take that up that uh, that social media topic up. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, how have you been? How long have you been actually doing the Twitter and the Instagram? That's the first question. The Twitter is very new. <laughs> the Twitter is, and you would probably know this because you would probably want to comment a lot or share one of my first posts. So Twitter is super new, and that's only because I found out recently by another artist that she was using it, getting a lot of help from it. So yeah, uh, Twitter's a great community. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. But I also the thing I like about Twitter is I can follow people that are in the field of doing work. And that's the stuff that I find interesting because then I could learn about new species that are need help that I would otherwise know about and and just following their journey. Because I'm jealous. I want to be out in the bush doing what they're doing. So I feel like I can follow what they're up to and I always feel like I'm out there with them. So that's what I like about you know? And it takes a lot of the, that's a lot of the crap out that you don't want to see. It's kind of Facebook, whether you like it or not, you're exposed to stuff that you're really not into. It doesn't matter if it's following or not. You see so much that, and some of those things get down. I just want to be around positive stuff that, that I like looking at. And the way I don't want to be on social media. I wish I couldn't be on social media, but to do this for a living. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit like you, Sally, in that I love the positive stuff. I basically don't do Facebook. I gave Facebook away. I post all the bird emergency stuff to Facebook, and maybe once every two months I'll go and have a look if I've got any comments or anything. But I interact on Twitter all the time, and I'm trying to do Instagram, but it's a matter of time for me. But Twitter is where I hook up with bird people i get slapped around the around the chops if i make a mistake which i do because i produce so much content now it's easy to do and i'm one of those believers that if i can talk to someone every day about birds and about conservation and put it out there eventually google and the algorithms will find it throw another podcast out is it perfect no (laughs) is my twitter feed perfect no is but I think it's better. Look, actually, I'll raise something with you, Brendan. You said you made a comment about the Western ground parrot and about how they're a bit secretive and all that. And if you are painting the Western ground parrot on a facility about the Western ground parrot, is that more effective than if you were to do it on an overpass of a freeway or on the on a wall at the entrance to a busy super shopping centre? Where do you reckon art is more effective in communicating conservation needs and the and the plight of an endangered bird, animal or plant? Yeah. Or vegetation community. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, uh, you're right. So for me, the way that I've thought about my works for about four or five years now is I will paint the species found within 15 kilometres of the location that I paint. So for the West Brown era, that's where they were doing the breeding program. And a lot of people would know that. But if they were to go add a little bit to the right-hand side of that mural, 
that people could look up. And it also had the, uh, a link to the Friends of the West Ground Parrot website. So they can go on there and they could find some information out. And that, and then if they went on that website, they would also see that the Pat Zoo is doing their breeding program. So in a way, seeing how many people are going forward to, to read the information, because that's what I always find interesting. I'm always in the ground, whether on foot, information written on mural, and then risk of changing the way the mural looks by adding that text to it or leaving it out and then putting all that information on my social media. So as far as letting people know where they, these apps are found from the murals, I can try to include that on my social media. And that has worked a few instances. If I paint a mural in a suburb of a bird that, that a follower has seen before, I've had people ask, what reserve can I see that bird? But that in itself is showing people's interest from a mural to go and see something they haven't seen before. And I think knowing that they can see things they haven't seen before so close to them is quite an exciting. I find it exciting knowing that there's so many species I need to see in the wild that are still so close to home. It's almost like a collecting trading cards or something, like it's the excitement of not knowing that it finds. But yeah, I'm trying to raise awareness of what we have basically in our back pocket because if people don't even know what we have down the road, Obviously, they're not going to know about the West Ground Parrot. And I think the way that, the way that the world works is if it's not an animal that's going to bring tourism in, it's just going to get kicked to the side. It's not important. If it's not going to bring in tourist money, it's just not important. And it will just go. It was, no, there may be a day in the West Ground Parrot here anymore. When it comes to getting media coverage, I hear a lot about the Night Parrot. But I don't hear too much about the West Ground Parrot. As far as numbers go, I would imagine they'd be quite similar. But uh, can I contend something about that though? Because I'm a bit older than the new Brenton, and you are, I, yeah. and when I was a kid, a bird nerd, the night parrot was. Does it still exist? Yeah, we'd given up on the paradise parrot, right? Yeah. But does the night parrot still exist? Yeah. So that was the big mystery. And then, yeah. and then when I become in my 40, there's a fellow who says he's found it and nobody believes him because he's yeah. pulled a con once before. Yeah, yeah. And then, and so everyone goes, oh, it's probably gone. And yeah. then somebody photo there's photos and it's from the guy who's supposed to not know any who, to not be believed yeah. and it's all yeah. true and then a whole bunch of people uh secure yeah. research money and they go looking and good yeah. on them james and nick and neil and everyone who's been out doing that work that's good yeah. but that's why you're hearing about it because yeah. there was a yeah. bloody controversy if yeah. there wasn't a controversy Please. if it look i spoke so to neil hamilton not- I spoke definitely, but I spoke to Neil Hamilton and we've got his his podcast will be coming out soon. But he's been talking to the traditional owners in that in parts of the Night Parrot range. They knew it was there. Nobody would but nobody who'd published a paper had talked to them about it. So it was all just anecdotal and whatnot. But hey, without the controversy. Bristle bird, hello. Scrub, re- yeah. a, a scrub bird, hello. Yeah. Not yeah. sexy. Yeah. No, equally as under threat as the Western yeah. ground parrot. Yeah, but then recently, though, which is great. Good. That really highlights the whole point that yeah. little brown birds, equally yeah. threatened, equally as important, in the same yeah. locations. Yeah. Where's the, where's the interactive information centre for the brown bird? Yeah. So I think it's all about if I could find a way to make a lot of these brown birds look amazing on a mural, I would. And that's the unfortunate thing. I'm, I'm deflated by what the client wants in play. Yeah, yeah. At the same time, I could use a little bit of my knowledge and swaying them. So if someone's wanting a rainbow lorikey, I could push them to a red cat parrot. I can say, yeah. have you seen this bird before? This bird comes around some of your location that you're in. Why not go for this? This is an old planet, but it's not. It is a native. It's meant to be here. So one like this, but a lot of the little brown birds, I can't help but think that at the end of the day, they're not attractive enough to eat. And so one of the reasons I wanted to really talk to you about this stuff, Brenton, was that 
people are seeking you out to make statements, right? There's yeah. a, a lot of your commissions, and this isn't a criticism of the people no. who, who are who are engaging you, but it's there, there's a real look at me factor, right? If it can be seen from the street, it's like, wow, look at this. Yeah. It's not a new Porsche, but it's something that that people will that people can see and will notice and will talk about and whatnot. So what I'm what I'm interested in, because I think we just take it as given that your stuff is noticed and it it gets people talking in the neighborhood, but yep. doesn't move the needle for the individuals. Do they actually then go from thinking it's nice and pretty? And this is the whole Gouldy and Finch versus Little Brown Bird kind of issue. Yep. Do they then get involved in conservation or support other things? This is where yeah. the question really is. But Does art me, move the needle? For me, it's about making that individual feel special about what they've got on their wall. So I have to leave them with a little bit of education about what they've had painted on the wall. So if they came into it hiring me just because they wanted a pretty picture, I've got to make sure that leave with a little bit of knowledge. Our black hawk two species are always going to be the birds that people want because they love them. But funny enough, a lot of them don't realise the status that they're in. A lot of them, because of all the things happening outside, it's around the southwest area, big it's residential gardens. So people just think, oh, we're lucky, but they don't realise why they're here. So for me, if I'm going to paint one on someone's wall, and they say, oh, it's my favourite bird. It flies over my house every day. And then it's up to me to say why it's flying over the house every day. It's all the logging that's happening. They're getting kicked out of their natural habitat. So for me, it's a kind of a cold deal. It's getting the mural, but I need to share a little bit with them. Otherwise, for me, it's what's the point. Like For me, I love doing what I do, but it needs to serve a purpose. And that's why with Sally, like following Sally's work, her donations, it started getting me thinking because... And I do get a lot of the comments in public forums saying it's a shame that these murals are going to be the last thing remaining of the species. And that's the opposite of what I want. So yeah. And, if I've got a profit on these birds, it's not right. For me, it's not right. So I need to give it back. So which is what I'm going to start doing. Yeah. There's some uh, all sorts of ideas about that, Brenton, which we can explore in uh, another time. And I really do want to get you back when we've got some time to talk about the nuts and bolts about how you do the work, because I know a lot of people have said to me, how do they do it? And yeah. and I put up, uh, do piles of tweets, and I put out piles of information about birds yeah. and work really hard doing it. I yeah. took a photo when I was on my way to a meeting. So I just went past, saw it, saw this mural, on not on the front wall, uh, down just down a little alleyway, took a photo, just whacked it up because I'm on Twitter, I'm walking down the street, I'm always on Twitter. <laughs> so flung it up there. My most interacted with tweet in 10 years and something like 24,000 tweets or something, and it's a picture of a willy wagtail, a magpie, something else. I ra- I'm pretty sure a rainbow lorikeet was on it. I'll give them a plug. Melbourne Murals did it, but... A hundred podcasts, talking to experts, talking to conservationists. I'm lucky to break through for 300 things in two years and is hundreds and hundreds of people wanting to reshare and and whatnot something which is inanimate birds, which kind of is really frustrating. I don't know. It it frustrates me. Yes. Honestly, it does. I don't know if you saw it, but the recent Gardening Australia segment that came out, I wanted them not to, I didn't want them to put silos in because I didn't want them. I didn't want that program to label that the silo lighters, which is what happened all the features, all the, sorry, all the comments were, did you see the segment on the silo artist? I didn't want that. It's great that I did the silo and what it raised awareness for was the main part of that silo. So that I painted the red tailed fastigale on that silo. And the reason why they didn't extend the land to the left of that CBH building was because they, they were breeding in there. So I wanted that to be a big part of the silo and let people know that's how connected I want my work to be. Like literally, they weren't allowed to build right here because this animal was right there. But I understand that they wanted to use the wow factor. Like when it comes to this kind of work, wow factor gets coverage and even murals, that's still a wow factor. Like you were saying about the tweet, 
it's bigger if it's bigger than if it's bigger than an A4 sheet of paper, it's going to get a bit of wow factor. If it's big, it's basically, it's bigger than real life. That's what it comes. And if it's colourful as well, it, it draws your eye. And that's with social media, posting in a text tweet or something, it's obviously it's not going to get seen over a photo. So you like with, for people to be spreading any information that's necessary to be read, you almost have to attach a photo with it because it's people scrolling through it, they're not going to stop. Sure. That's right. Unless it's politics snark and you're in a hashtag that people are there for it. But yet you're quite right. If you're just, you're new to Twitter, Brenton, but I've been on it for so many years I, and yeah. I've got a couple of like yeah, personal. I've got my right now. <laughs> but I, I used to get people years ago when it, just on a personal thing, I'd put things like, I just had an amazing coffee, best coffee I've had for three weeks. And I'd get loads of engagement. Because it was new yeah. and it was cool and it was fun yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. And now yeah. it's just full of PR dross and promoted tweets and all that kind of stuff. But look, yeah. Sally, I, I want to ask you what, how do you, what do your passion is the rescue centers yeah. and wildlife rehabilitation and release if possible and whatnot. Yeah. How do you feel when someone with, Brenton's profile now is getting so much attention and we're not saying it's a bad thing, so, hey, ease off, everyone, but that something actually I'll frame in a different way. I think in class, what Sally and I do in the same sort of thing. No, no, no. I think no. all went sideways. Yeah. No, no you're, you're, not in, you're not in the same playpen, but, yeah. but, it, but what I'm interested in, in is that how can some art get uh, get impact and some doesn't, and what do you ne- what do you need to do or what could be done in an art sense? I hate using the word product and whatnot, but it's to to increase the awareness and perhaps the financial health of something like a wildlife rehabilitation shelter or a, yeah, that's probably a really good example. There's one here not far from my place that struggles to get money to feed the the animals. Yeah. But then, then Dr. Harry visited and a couple of, an hour in primetime TV really moved, moved the needle. Yeah, they'd be nice if you went to Karakin or Kanyama. That'd be good. Maybe. Well, I don't know. That's what I wanted to ask you and perhaps try and lead the discussion in a slightly different place. What's the best way for your art, Sally, to help? Like you've got to sell stuff for yourself to eat, to yeah. pay the mortgage and everything. But yeah. what kind of ways, let's put it a different way, let's take it away from just the centres that you're really invested in personally. Mm-hmm. What kind of way do you think an artist who is doing work like yourself can have an impact on okay. on conservation and public awareness? I think, personally, I'm not going to force any sea change. I'm not going to be a big cog in this whole thing. Sometimes I've thought about this a lot, and I sometimes feel a little bit helpless in the face of the destruction of habitat and things like that. Now, I'm a Brit, so for me, as I've said to you, coming here, I'm absolutely astonished by everything here. It's so dramatic. The birds, the plants, the land is just wonderful to me. And I'm astonished that we don't preserve it enough or as much as maybe it would be nice if we did. I don't talk about things that I don't know about because I'm older and wiser, but I think that's my impression. But I do know that I might not be able to make a big difference but I can make a difference I can do what I do I'm only one person and I'm just a bird artist so I happen to love birds and so for me I did used to volunteer but I just this business took off so mad especially the last couple of years and I thought how can I help then and so for me the way I've done it is to actually have a relationship with Harakin particularly and just recently Kanyana and I'm hoping as well to get something going with the Western Seabird Rescue as well, where I will actually either go in and photograph their residents and draw those, and then I'll sell prints through my website 
and any sales that go through my website, they get the profit. So it doesn't cost me anything. I can't afford to support it without covering my costs. I pay for my prints and it's that, and the photography, I wear it, but obviously I keep the original and they get the profits that way. And it comes and it goes. It's sometimes like lockdown was ridiculous. I, I just sold so many. Uh, there was one in particular of a pair of black cockatoos from Karakin. It just kept going out the door. It was fantastic. And that's what I can do. And the other thing is, we, you know, through our social media, I'll say, I love a bit of social media. I mean, I will just plug them every time I can. And any time I go there and people ask me questions, this, uh, my two main questions, three main questions. How long did that take you? What pencils do you use? And where's this bird? Where can, where is this bird? Can I go and see them? And so I yeah. tell them all about it and I say, yep, yeah, go here. Any money you put in is going to help. And it's just a small thing. It's not, I'm not going to make a massive change, but I can make a change. And it's a community as well. You talk about followers. It's a community. We all talk about these things and awareness is raised. And as I say, I do, you do sometimes feel a little bit helpless, but at the same time, every little helps. It's like climate change. You might think to yourself, what's the point of me doing anything in China? Aren't going to stop belching out smoke and this, that and the other. But everything you do in your life, it does make a difference. And it's the same with it. So if you plant some nice stuff in your garden, that's going to be nice for our native birds or put water out in the garden or put a nesting box up or there's so many things or donate to your local centre or volunteer at your local centre. It does, it all helps. And it, everybody's talking about it. That's the thing. We need to be talking about it because it's Sally, the wildlife is Sally, so special. I can't let I can't let the opportunity go when you've raised those three questions that you get asked all the time. So tell us about the co- uh, the cocky there and uh, those three questions. How long did it take? <laughs> well, it depends how you look at it. You can say it took three weeks. So it could have taken, so it took me the last seven years of honing it and getting it right. I think I don't, I don't rush. I, I'm old lady now, so I learned I had to be patient and slow down. <laughs> so I just put the podcast on or the audio book and I really take my time over it. And so that, that guy was probably about three weeks, but yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I just, when you're at the beginning, there's not much to start with. There's just an outline really. You just have to chip away at it. This one here is nothing to the one I'm doing now. What I'm doing now is, oh, mammoth. <laughs> it's just <laughs> chipping away and, and pencils. I've got a list copied in my notes for every time anyone asks me what pencils I use. Perhaps you might share that with me and I'll pop that on the oh, yeah. uh, on the web page because people will be wanting to know. what's What are the materials involved in that cockatoo picture we've got up okay, on the screen? Okay, so with that guy, I work on map board, which you use in picture framing, the little window you get inside the frame and you're out where it's behind it, flip it over and bad side. And I do my sketch, which is very simple. It's not, no point putting any detail because it's going to get all covered up. And then I prime that with a primer, which is a nice rough surface. And then it's just blocks of color. So that guy was pretty much black all over, apart from his beak and his little cheek patch and then it's fixed and that's using these big pastels like this so the proper pastels and then i fix it with a spray fixative and then the rest is done with pastel pencils and color pencils and color pencils if you can see my pencils they just they cover a whole desk i've got hundreds and hundreds of them and then i just work out from dark to light from blocks of color up right up to the fine detail and that's about it really now, because I had the picture up of the of the cocky and the emu, can you show us that pastel again so that people can actually see how big it is in relation to your head? There we are. Okay. This <laughs> <laughs> is my favourite. These are arts like extra soft square pastels. They're lovely and they're really good for coverage. But also, right at the end, when I've done all the other bits, I'll go back and I'll look at it and think, is there enough? Is there a really nice dark point in there? And is there a really nice bright point in there? Because you don't want it all mid tone and you can't get a white pastel pencil that's really white. So I'll use one of these, but in the white, uh, just to finish off. So on that uh, black cookie, that would have been some of the ends of these little feathers and any really bright white highlights. Cause it's really important to have those really dark points and really bright points in a picture. Otherwise it could be a little bit samey. So, yeah, and that's that. Yeah. 
Very good. I just want to take a, a, a minute to acknowledge Naomi Bergeson on Facebook, who gave us a nice... And that was a long time ago, but I didn't get the opportunity to pull up the discussion. And, there. and Ramona. Thanks to Ramona. So you have to know. Yes, we're, yeah, where are we? Let, actually, let's let's talk about that. Ramona Sand and Art. So I'm guessing that the Ramona is an artist. Ramona said as an Insta follower of both Sally and Brenton for years, oh, they're in... They're, their information and enthusiasm have made me learn much more about my local birds. Now, that's really what the whole point of starting the discussion is, and I appreciate the, the comment, Ramona. It's great. But to both of you, I'm, and perhaps, Brenton, this might be a little bit more in your wheelhouse, but are you getting asked by organisations, perhaps companies or government affiliated body quangos or those and stuff to support them and do do stuff for them and what i'm trying to tw- tease out is m- most of your work is commissions from private yep. organizations or individuals who yep. are happy to pay you to do the artwork and see yep. it as that kind of transaction what i'm wondering about is if people and organizations that are not profit makers or just private uh, enjoyers of art, appreciators, connoisseurs, whether with a profile comes people wanting you to to support what they're doing, their good cause or their purpose for being, that in essentially are people asking you to to give them a discount? It it does come up. So with my work, I have to basically let people know how much a neural's going to cost and that there's a minimum and generally people want a lot for a little. So they want to get, they want to get a, a mural for my minimum cost generally. So it's up to me to make a vibrant mural for them for the amount that they want to spend. Then there's the people that's, that come along and say, I've got this budget, which is generally, it, it's sometimes it's a nice budget, and they'd say, love what you do. We respect how you do it and the research you put into it. We want you to have fun on this wall. And this is our budget. So that shows me that people are involved in what I'm doing and also possibly the story that comes along with it. So... If I do have people that will sit with me while I paint, that we will just have conversations all day. And those conversations will go into conservation, go into talking about species that live in the area and stuff. And so it's those conversations that become part of the mural. And those are the clients that I love to work with because I want to be paid to people that are invested in what I'm doing. When I'm doing work for commercial businesses, signs of apartment buildings, things like that. I have to go into it realising that they're just beautifying the start of the building and that's all it is to them. So for me, it's quite important to get some interpretive signage set up as part of that mural. So that interpretive signage will have the species names and possibly the locations close to that building where it's in it. So that at least it's not just a pretty picture. If something people could get a bit of knowledge from, they're even if they're walking past that building, going to the shops one day and to grab some milk, they might come past and say, hey, what's that sign there? Have a bit of a read. And then the, the name of the park that's around the corner might stick with it. And they might say, oh, I'm going to grab my kids one day. Sunday afternoon, we might go down to that park and have a look. Didn't even know that park was there. So maybe if, it, if it's something as small as that, small as someone going out to a park, that's better than it not happening for me anyway. The more that I can do from just a pretty picture. That's my aim is to get the most out of just a pretty picture. So whether that be interpretive signage, whether that be sharing a bit of knowledge, whether that, yeah, it's got it. The mural itself has to give something. Thanks, Nicole Brown, for a bit of Facebook love as well. Appreciate that. Again, a reminder for those of you who are watching on all the platforms, Twitch, Facebook and YouTube, thanks. If there's something I'm not asking that you want to know in the comments, stick it in and I will put it up and we'll talk about it. Brenton, with your profile growing 
and obviously you're basically just working in your local hood, you can become a bit of a big deal. Have you been approached to do work that you just weren't prepared to do for any reason? Yeah, I actually turned down a lot of work. So I probably turned down, I probably turned down, I would say, one laughing kookaburra a month. I probably turned down about three months. And okay, then- that, can I just stop you there? Sorry, Brendan. I just want to stop you there because people who are not in Perth will go, what's he got against kookaburras? Why won't he paint rainbow lorikeets? Would, the floor is yours, my friend. Yes, mate. <laughs> Obviously, the, the, those two species are not native to Western Australia. The laughing kookaburra was, from my memory, walked to Western Australia, the Perth Zoo, and bred up to take a uh, to help out with the snake issue was my knowledge, and they were released to take care of the. Uh, I'm assuming while a while ago we had a lot of snake issues. So to my knowledge, that's why they were released, and they basically take them off. People love them. I understand why people love them, but they do a lot of things to our native birds. So. They are a murder bird. They are. They are. <laughs> yeah. And I think you could probably say that the rainbow orchids are about a murder bird. <laughs> that's right. Well, yeah. Yeah. As well, the rainbow orchids they take over a lot of other species. Very aggressive, and if you were to go down near the local park, I guarantee you to see nests in I guarantee you probably won't see many other nests in the hollows you see them Yeah, they, dom- they dominate, and I don't think a lot of Australians on this side of the continent are aware of what a problem they are I- in Perth and yeah. in New Zealand yeah. as well, where they have yeah. established, and they are a terror. They're a bully, and they dominate for nesting sites, if a pair can't get hold of a suitable place on their own, the group will come down and mob competitors and whatnot. So they outcompete all the bigger birds for hollows. And, uh, yeah. yeah, they're a bit of a drama, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll share this knowledge with a lot of a lot of people been wanting uh, these female inquiries. And they were saying, that's all good, but I love that. So I want you to paint it. Yeah. I'll just say, I'm not the other. But you get the notes and the, do the job. That's very WA. I'll be able to stuff with people over east, so I'm allowed to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, also get approached, I also get approached to do Western Australia. Yeah. I don't do that. So I, I'm only in the WA. I don't place. I'm fortunate to know a few artists from the East Coast. So I do get inquiries. I'll generally get them. You're fortunate. You're in the fortunate position that you can no, I don't. say no. But the other thing I was interested in, Brenton, with the profile that comes from what when you're on Gardening Australia and and beca- having your, your name on walls in public spaces so that people start to chase you down, do you get far more offers for commissions now than you could possibly do? I've just recently hired an admin assistant and that's changed a lot for me. Lucky so, Yes. So up until then, it was basically I would answer emails in chat hoods and that kind of means that a lot of the inquiries would just get forgotten about. That's not what I want to watch everyone to get, get slotted into the calendar and they have their time. Now that I'm able, with social media and all the other platforms, this inquiry is coming to so many different places. Gardening Australia and those sorts of programs are amazing, but at the end of the day, if I and myself couldn't be on the program, that would be where I want to, I want to be. I want the artwork to be doing more than just me getting light lighter. But that's why I'm trying to give the art, I don't know, give the art a meaning, have it do more than just get shared around the internet and get hundreds of likes like that. That's great. If it's not doing anything for the whole life that I need, then what's the point? Yeah, but it I'll, might, I'll, be, I'll, might be just one person who looks at it and says, "Oh, what's that? I'm going to look that." Yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, that's great. But yeah, I would love to see art. That, that's, that's the end goal. And I really uh, <laughs> and I want to follow up on that bit about doing something for the species and whatnot in a minute. But yeah, we Sally told us about how long it took and what she used. I want to throw that kind of question at you, Brenton. Just yeah. let's look at the tanks because we get an idea of the scale of them. Yeah. There we are. Of, and, of course, the methodology 
in yeah. involved in it. How long did that project take from you to getting the crimson chat photograph the the drag? Obviously, you've taken some photo photos of the of the plants. You've come up with your concept. How long does yeah. it take to actually put right. it together? A lot of the photos of the flora I didn't take myself. I did take photos when I got up to Tom Price. I found a lot of these species close to the location I was painting, which meant that I was able to have different angles. So then I switched from the, the flora that I found on the internet to some of my own photos, which is quite handy. They actually, some of them looked a little bit different up close and that just made either the light that the photos were taken in, but working under the Pilbara sunlight, the colours really showed. So that was really great. But, but there's a lot of time in the research phase. I naturalist, the flora base. These are a lot of the websites that I like to use to really pin down the location of species. But then also just contacting photographers. So Ross McDibbon took the photo of the retail drag in there. I just queried him on what I could find around Tom Price and told him where I was painting it. They gave me all the knowledge I really needed. So, you know, the, there is time that goes into just talking to some of these people that have the knowledge. They, I hadn't been there before. Why should I just pull species out of my head that don't make sense? There was a lot of research and there's always a lot of research that goes into to a lot of the murals that I'm doing because I don't want to get it wrong. I want it to, I want it to be right. So the murals themselves, from memory, it was 20, 24 days, I think it was for both. So to complete both. So. Quite different to the way Sally works. And obviously I was talking about stripping the murals down and simplifying them. If I did do that, and if I made the photo realistic, just would it be profitable for me? Because I would be losing money by spending that much time on a project. Budgets allowed for the project. I have to take a lot of things into consideration as far as how long something's going to take. And I need to know how long something's going to take before I put up a price for it so that that just comes with time spent on painting different subjects nowadays i'll know how long what's the story those tanks at at tom price who was that a private commission or is that like at a at a public body yeah so the unfortunate thing with that specific mural is it's not visible to the public it's inside of a rio sensor fine site okay and that in itself rung alarm bells for me had a Rio Tinto site. Hey, yeah, I did a lot of clearing. Let's, <laughs> hope, let's hope that they don't blow up. That's yeah, cool. yes, let's hope that. Yeah, they do have a lot of land, which is not because they got a lot of land. But I think they'll be saving something does blow up, which is yeah, it is a shame. It's such a tricky thing. At the end of the day, and some murals. So that 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 mural itself was a gift to Rio Tinto as a celebration. I can't remember the exact celebration, but it was basically a gift to finalise the project. So that site was just about ready for handover. At least the mural that was saying, thank you for everything, this is our gift to you. Hence why it's only seen side of the mine site. So can you clarify that? Who was giving it to one of the biggest companies in the world? Hello, you really need a gift. Yeah. I wasn't told all the small small details. But it was one of the one of the management groups that worked in for Rio to to set up the site. Okay, um, with their gift to Rio. T- so at the end of the day, all of these projects, I have to understand that if I said no to that project, they wouldn't approach someone else to do a mural. Yeah, and that and, mural would not have served the purpose. And I guess there's the other side of it too. The mural's going to get done. It may, as if you can convey a positive, worthwhile message out of it, it may as well buy your wheat bix for a few months as somebody else's who isn't as committed to doing other things. Yeah, it it supports you, but it, yeah. but it's a compromise you have to think about, isn't it? You have to think it about it and it make the compromise to do it. Yeah, yeah, and I am doing more and more projects. For, co- for commercial projects where, unfortunately, there, there may be land clear involved and it's up to me to say, yes, I'm going to do that project or no, I'm not. So I have to look into flora and fauna surveys and find out a lot about the land before I even say, yes, I'm coming on board. So that's, the, that's a lot of the research that I'm now lucky that I can 
do thanks to having an admin assistant. I've got that extra spare time. But there is a still a lot of projects that I would say no to based purely on the lab. It goes against everything that I'm getting on the bow. Yeah, totally understand what you say there. But I'm always a contrarian with some of these things too, Brendan. Yeah. I, I would think sometimes there might be some benefit if there's, as your profile grows, if you can do a project where there may be some land clearing involved, but then talk about it everywhere you possibly can, saying these bastards are still cutting down this stuff or bulldozing yeah. this stuff, that yeah. that that in a way you can turn a negative into a positive and yeah. if it's a corporate thing, for them yeah. it might turn what they think is a positive into a bloody big negative. Yeah. The day that I did that would mean that it would be the last job I get, I would just say. <laughs> well, but in in that sector perhaps. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. I, I definitely looked into any corporate job that I now do. I would love to find a group that does plantings. So I would love to end up work on a site that is blankly and I'd like to, if I could. Make it part of your contract. That, well, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, and yeah. put that back somewhere else to just say, if you want my painting, you are going to have to put this money into planting some trees somewhere that I request. Otherwise, you don't need to do the painting. <laughs> okay. Th- that leads me to where I wanted to come to at the end, talking about new stuff, opportunities, raising yeah. money for con- for conservation. Sally, yeah. raising money for, for wildlife rescue, rehabilitation, interactive signage, all that kind of stuff, which it gets tacked on but sometimes doesn't get done well. Now, we're using new technology. It's not that new, but 50 years ago, we artists couldn't do what we're doing now and then stick it up somewhere and for it to last for another god knows how many years and how many people will see it tease stuff like that tell uh, each of you tell me what you think what about nft i don't understand okay, on the computer okay no. how about stuff your images on merch that is is there that the selling of the merch is only to direct money to, for instance, Friends of the Western Ground Parrot. Or And what got me interested in this is, have you seen those Botanica ads on TV at the moment where they're saying, oh, we, we're putting money towards saving 20 of Australia's most endangered wildflowers and whatnot? And I'm thinking, all right, Maybe you're putting one cent or something or two cents per whatever towards something, but they don't explain where it goes. Like they're not saying to to King's Park's hey. breeding program or a seed bank or anything like that. Yeah. And all the it's just like total greenwashing. And for me, maybe the people of Botanica have got the best intentions, but I don't know what you're bloody well saving. And you're not explaining it. And you're not putting a link to something on, so it's just an ad saying we're good, love us, yeah. buy our shit. Um, yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I get annoyed. It would be too harsh. I think that's better that they're saying something like that than not saying it at all and not giving the tops about it. So but maybe they are. Maybe they're actually- but here's my point, though, Sally. Is it I have to get involved with their brand to? Yes to save those 20 species. I don't know what the 20 species are unless I unless I go to their website and check out what they're doing or I buy their product and read a box. I would have been more impressed if they said, last year we gave $50,000 to Kings Park Breeding Program. Aren't we good corporate citizens? If that was on the ad or something, I would think, Good on you, Botanica, but no. Yeah, Ames Works will be saying exactly that because you said this. We're talking but, about it. We're talking about it, but I'm not being positive about it because most of these things generally are. Remember the dolphin stuff on tuna? And then if you chase it down, you find out it was like 0.05 cents or something for every 2,000 Ten sold or something. So over a year, they've given a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or something to something for a company of that size. That's point oh 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 one percent of their global profit. 
piss off. Yeah. That's my view. I, you don't need to be associated with that view. <laughs> but that, but to me, that's like a billionaire giving five five hundred thousand dollars to something is less significant than yeah. someone who's unemployed given fifty bucks. In it's just, but we are lauding stuff that is easy to do. But as Brenton, you said before, we're still for we're still cutting down habitat that we can't replace. We can't replace it in a hundred years, even if we set land aside and raise funds and all that. We just got to stop doing the bad stuff and then attaching goodness to second rate solutions. That's my view. Who wants to read out Nicole's lovely comment? Oh, there's a nice comment. I'll read it. Love Brenton's comment, the hope for art saving species and Sally's and Mary's statement about not necessarily making a big change, but making a change. Thank you all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. For, <clears throat> thanks for being positive and because I'm always going to be a grizzle guts about <laughs> this kind of stuff because I just get annoyed that it's really easy. And it, actually, it's really easy to do stuff that doesn't have any effect. And that's what yeah. disappoints me. Look, let me get right out there. Look, all these groups have got comms people and whatnot, raising awareness. We've got a comms team, but no one's producing any content with any bloody information. It's all PR. It's all branding. And that mm. kind of upsets me. If anyone doesn't know, I'm a grumpy, I'm a grumpy old man because <laughs> so we resources are so hard to get in conservation. Is there a full-time staffer? Is there someone doing full-time practical conservation work actually on the ground in the habitat? I don't know because it's all a bloody secret. There's a lot of volunteers, a lot of volunteers yeah. but they're always asking for help. But, but that's the point I'm yeah. making, Brendan, is that all these conservation efforts nowadays, governments of all colours and sizes are doing the stuff based on other people giving their time. You have to be personally invested and care for something for the time is. That just shows how many people yeah. care about yeah. these things that need help. They just don't have that care factor. So yeah. unless you have but, that care factor. But we yeah. have organisations yeah. that have the responsibility to protect these things, right? They're called governments. They're called departments of conservation. We've got national one. Lots of the species that draw tourists. But that's not how the laws are drawn. That's not where the responsibility lies. It's not we have the responsibility to save red birds, not green birds. That... So where I get frustrated, and look, I, people have probably heard me say it a thousand times if they follow any of my stuff, that we shouldn't... Conservation shouldn't be based on volunteers. If no. you can find... it. If you can find $40 billion in JobKeeper to give it to companies that don't need it, what was it, 14? All of the government, all the private schools that got JobKeeper didn't need it. That money could have gone to buying Habitat so it didn't need to get cleared and actually done something. And that's where my frustration is, that we're always saying, oh, it's too expensive, we can't find any money, and we're just pissed $40 billion out against the wall, giving it to Harvey Norman when he didn't need it. Or Jerry Harvey, not Harvey Norman. So that's the kind of stuff that makes my blood boil. And uh, I don't know. And then everyone wants you, you, Brenton, and you, Sally. Can you give us a free picture that we can auction off to raise money? That's the kind of request I'm sure you get. Um, Whereas you think, why uh, the bloody zoo has got an interactive centre for something? Why can't they find twenty thousand bucks a year to do for the volunteers to do stuff? Why should people be having to give give up? And I'm uh, look and please, I'm not being super critical of the zoo. It's just that situation that we're that we've all found ourselves in. That everyone who loves the birds or the plants or the quolls or the quokkas or the the dingo or let's there's just so many the paddy melons the bandicoots the the antinuses the corroboree frog it's the mary river turtle there's just so many examples of where people are having to give up their time to do something that the government should be doing while they're talking about building a bloody 
billion dollar dam. That's the thing that frustrates me. For that, look, put tell us in the comments whether I'm just a grumpy old bastard. I should <laughs> shut up right? because I think there's not a thousand of you out there, Grant. I'm pretty sure there. There's got to be 50,000 of us. Uh, yeah. Actually, I should be in a better mood because we've kicked the bastards out on the weekend. The, the, yeah. Sorry, I don't want to be too political. Yeah. We had a threatened species recovery hub, and uh, this makes me feel better. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> totally agree. That that makes me feel better because sometimes I feel like I'm shouting into a yeah. bloody hur- a, a hurricane. Yeah. But the country did something good for so many reasons, but hopefully conservation's going to have a chance in the next little while. But I'm a bit concerned, and I'll tell you why. All I've heard in the last few days is climate change, climate change, climate change, climate change, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I haven't heard anyone whispering, biodiversity, 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 biodiversity. So I'm a little bit concerned that there'll be all these targets and that Andrew Forrest will have his hand out for some hydrogen money and Woodside will be looking for something and all the electricity companies will all be looking for some public money to do something with photovoltaics and wind farms, which is all needed, but I'm still not hearing anyone say, biodiversity, biodiversity, let's stop cutting down our old growth forests in Victoria. Dan Andrews, Lily D'Ambrosio, stop it. For an industry that supports less people than sell then shop assistants selling Tats Lotto. And I don't hear anyone saying, save the Tats Lotto, save the retail workers. I don't hear anyone saying that, but 300 people who cut down trees, all of a sudden we can't afford to pay them out. It's, oh, anyway, anyway, there we go. Thanks, Nicole, for your support because, <laughs> by Jingo, I'm getting old and grumpy and I've been shouting this stuff since 1984. I've, I've been saying the same thing for that long, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Where the this comes in, isn't it? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm overdoing nothing about it, which is why I decided to. I thought about making a podcast in, I <laughs> thought about starting this in 2014. It took me until 2020 to actually do my first interview and actually put the thing out and now I try and put something out every day and hopefully it shifts the needle somewhere but I can't talk to I can't talk to decision makers because all they want to do is talk to people who will go isn't that fantastic what you did I didn't even I'm not even on the mailing list of the people who announce that they released captive bred orange bellied parrots Who's a natural ally? Channel 10? Channel 10 or me? Anyway, yeah. it's enough whinging. I don't want to criticise people either, but I don't want to criticise them. But Jesus Christ, what? I was, sorry, I'll get, now I'm going to get assassinated for that. It just seems nuts. There's so many people who want to do stuff and want to help, and it's all captured now with comms and PR and what'll look good and everything. And really all we need to do is share information and help people do the right thing. All we have to do is do the right thing. Uh, Oh, Sarah Woodisfield. Have I pronounced that right? Sarah Woodisfield, is that the right thing? Thank you for the Facebook Facebook love. I don't know if that was a thumbs up or a heart. Oh, is that your daughter? UA, and she's in talk with a magpie research. No research. Uh, how clever they are. It, they're, not, they're out in the wild. They're not captured. Yeah, yeah. Is that the project about the the songs, the magpie vocalisations? I don't know about, I don't know if, there's, if it's that specific. They're checking their cognition. It's very interesting. So that uh, so that's Sarah, right? Yeah. Sarah, yeah. Sarah, Sarah hit me up. <laughs> oh, Sarah hit me up. News at bird emergency, the bird emergency <laughs> dot com. News at the bird emergency dot com. I want to talk about the magpie project and I, and there's a Willy Wagtail one I think going on over there too. And I want to talk about that. So yeah. Gang, I think we've taken up more than enough time of these working artists need to go and I, I'd really like to talk to you both again, perhaps a little bit more about process. Great. There we are. Sarah's just told us this is whose project it is at Amanda Ridley's research lab. Okay. Yeah. Still, do send me something in the email about it all, Sarah, if you could. I'd love to know. Brenton, 
been good to finally get yeah, yeah been a while. Yeah. get the yeah. eyeballs on each other. It has. It's probably been a it's probably been about eighteen months or so that we've been. Oh, it's Amanda Babler's research. Oh, there we go. That's right, isn't it, Sarah? Thumbs up if I'm right, Amanda Bab. Or is that no? I think Amanda Babler's the African one. No, I think I've got that wrong. Yeah, Amanda Ridley. Yeah, Sally. Thanks. Really enjoyed oh, meeting better. you too. And see you both. I've already now, met Brenton because I. Yeah, it's very small, but amazing how many artists they talk to. So we've got one day painting it here or something for us to, to meet her properly. Check him out. Yeah. And uh, before we do the where can I find you and all that stuff, which you've got to do at the end, it's obligatory at the end of anything like this. Nicole, thanks. I'm glad that I'm – I always feel ranty and shouty and grumpy and whatnot when I get fired up, but, God, it's just – actually. Read that out for me, Brendan, just so that when we do the, when we do the audio release, yes, that people sure. will know what Nicole's on about. Yeah, but Nicole's just said thanks, Graham. It's been fascinating and so inspiring. Share information, right thing. <laughs> Fantastic, and that was that was on Facebook, I think, because you can interact. That's the whole point of doing these things. I love it when people have something to say. I don't mind if you want to bag me out because I'm happy to take on any. I'm happy to discuss anything that we're talking about. Oh, at the, end of the day, being passionate is better than not being passionate. So. Oh yeah, that's right. Because we could be down gabbing a palmer and a pot in the pub, watching daytime television, and going, "Gee, Prue McSwain, she's a genius." So what now? What Sarah told us, Babbler and Magpie Research, great. Thank you. That would be good. Effects of climate change and heat stress on cognition. Fantastic. I. That's exactly what we're all about: finding out the research that people are doing and getting it off some behind a paywall journal site and we talk about it and it's out there and anybody can learn and know and get interested. That's what that's what the bird emergency is all about. Brenton, where can people look up your stuff? Yes, I I want most social media platforms. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Just type my name in Brenton C and come up. Yeah. And I'll put all the I'll put all the links on the on the page that we've got up for this little chat, which is thebirdemergency.com slash art. Sally, what about you? What would you like people to, to look at? And tell us where what can they do to help out the, the centres? You better send me the info for those too, and I'll put those links up. If they want to support the centres, you go onto my website, sallyabdomens.com. There are prints on there. They profit donated. They're either for Kanyana or Karakin. If you buy one of those prints through the website, all the profits will go to either of those centres. I cover my costs just for the print, basically. And then I'm on Instagram at Sally Edmonds Art and Facebook Edmonds Art. I'm not on Twitter yet. I will be. <laughs> oh, you're going to get onto. Oh, I'm going to get onto Twitter. I just put now. If you're listening, eventually, Sarah's put the Babbler Research website up, so it's https slash slash all that stuff. www babbler research dot com. If you're interested in that project, before we get around talking about it and whatnot, so please get into that. You can check me out on Twitter. Lots of ranty stuff. I get a lot of politics if I see stuff that needs to be said at Bird Emergency. Not the Bird Emergency, but the Bird Emergency is my Instagram. And, of course, the website is thebirdemergency.com. Took about 15 minutes to say all that to say goodbye, but it's that time of the day. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Brenton. Thanks, Thank everyone, you. for joining in. That's great. Thanks for the Sally and Ramona, Ramona Sandanat. Thank you. It's always great to get. Oh, we've got another bit of love too. And Catherine Rowe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The edited version of the audio will go out in the podcast feed eventually, but you can share this around thebirdemergency.com slash art. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed that. If you've got all the way to the end, well, then you must be loving the show. You can support the show, thebirdemergency.com slash coffee. See you next time.